Hi, I'm Lucinda. I'm a FinTech reporter with Axios. Uh, we're here to talk about faster payments in the United States. A very exciting time to talk about this, even if you can't really talk about it over, your parent, with, over Thanksgiving dinner with your parents. Uh, we are discussing effectively at a time when FN Now is coming into implementation. Uh, the first time our government is very belatedly coming into the recognition of how important fast and instant payments is for the economy. Um, I'm here with two really exciting guests, uh, Matt Bradza, payment product manager at Cross River, and Moa Agrel, senior partnership manager at Trustly. Thank you both for coming here today. Thanks. Thank you. So I wanted to kick it off for the audience with the poll uh, and we'll come and bring this back up later as well. So we wanted to ask what is the current reach of instant or near instant payments via the RTP network? Uh, so please choose. In the meantime, I will kick it off and let Matt please introduce yourself and tell us a little more about your job. Thanks. Uh, hey everyone, Matt Brazda. Um, as Lucinda said, I'm the product manager at Cross River managing payment rails. Um, I manage what we call our bank rails. So um, we think of, when we say bank rails, we are talking about wires, ACH, um, automated clearinghouse. That's a legacy side, as well as more of the emerging faster payments, such as real-time payments. And, um, and FedNow is obviously coming soon. Um, I've been at Cross River for about a year and a half. Um, previous to that, I was at the Clearinghouse, um, and then previous to that, I was at Cross River. So I was, actually was a boomerang, uh, but it's it's great to be here. I look forward to having a great discussion. Awesome! It's gonna be really exciting to talk about your Clearinghouse experience. Uh, Moa, can you also tell us a little bit more about your job? Of course. Well, um, thanks for having me. My name is Moa Agrel. I'm part of Trustly's Banking Partnerships team. I have been a uh, part of Trustly for about five and a half years now. I was with the European organization for three years, and then I transitioned into the North American organization uh, about two, I guess two and a half years ago now. And then I relocated, I'm from Stockholm, Sweden originally, and I relocated to San Francisco last year. So I've been here about uh, a year. Uh, our team is responsible for managing all of our banking partners. So working really closely with Cross River and super excited to be here uh, today. Um, I want to dig into that a little bit in a second, but uh, hopefully we have a uh, volume of answers. Let's see what people think. Okay, so it looks like most people, we have a bit of a tie. Most people think that 50% of BDAs or 65% of BDAs uh, are basically within the, the RTP network or have signed up to the RTP network. Um, so you guys are actually pretty on the money. Uh, that is That is pretty close. There are some folks that seem to think that it's a little more or less, but we're pretty much in the right range. The right answer is uh, actually 65% of US BDAs. So I'm curious, what do you to make of that answer, right? Do we think, uh, I should comment and add that in the last, uh, in, in Q3, I believe of last year, we hit around, I think 20 billion of transactions, worth of transactions within the RTP network. So when we're taking a look back on that history, can you tell me, basically what we should make of that. Uh, I'll start with Matt. Yeah, um, I, I think that there's obviously a massive opportunity um, for even more adoption that's already happened. Um, you know, I think with the introduction of FedNow as well, there's there's definitely a chance for both the networks to kind of you know be working together to create ultimately more DDA account reach in the US. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been really exciting. There's there's roughly 300 participating banks now on the RTP network. Um, and, you know, that number obviously is going to continue to grow. Um, so, you know, we're definitely privy to the fact that there's a lot of room um, and, you know, just continuing to work and educate these, you know, the banks that haven't joined yet, as well as, you know, our end customers is really the key there. Great. Maybe I'll pivot that a little bit to Moa, since you have a little, you have, you have this, you have a lot of banking relationships. You're looking at a lot of banks. Um, I'm curious, jumping off of what Matt just said, why aren't there more banks on it? Why is the opportunity still so large? In theory, instant payments to people, at least within fintech, do think that it's an obvious answer, but we haven't seen it boom in the same way that we've seen in other countries. I think I think there are a number of, of answers, I guess, to, to that question. Um, First of all, I mean, it's a, from, from my experience, especially looking at being part of the European organization and then coming here, I feel like the transition moving from 
non-instant to instant or like moving from the payment type that were available before to the payment types that are available now is bigger here. I, I feel like if we take SEPA, for example, uh, changing into SEPA instant, those changes are not as big, at least from, from a user perspective, it's essentially the, the speed. So I think getting adoption is one piece. Like how do I get people to actually choose the instant payment option? I think that's one. And then exactly what it means for the FIs to build and all the you know, implementations and education of uh, your staff. And, uh, and of course, all the technical pieces that Matt know way better than me, but there are a lot of things that you need to solve for to actually make it happen. Not only how do we build it, but also how do we get people to use it? And um, of course it's it's money. It's a big investment to to connect to it. And also what is the best option for me as an FI, you know, if I'm a, a very large one, then I'm assuming that they will connect to both. Maybe I'm a smaller one. I want to choose because I have to pick, you know, I don't have infinite of, you know, amount of money or time or resources and all these things. So there are all these things that just need to align, I think. And then again, I really want to call out that I think the adoption piece is really important because once we build it, how do we get people to use it? Um, I know that's a question to answer your question, but I think it's just a lot of pieces that need to fit together, if that makes sense. Right. I mean, that's the funny thing, right? We're kind of all in this space where everyone's trying to figure out both RTP, because RTP is still relatively new when we think about it, and, and also how FedNow is going to be implemented really fully come July. Um, let me take a step back and ask, how are each of your companies currently, because we've talked a little bit about RTP, how are each of your companies looking at and thinking about developing products or in and around Fed now when it when it does come through in July and I'll start with you Matt. Yeah. Um well I think it's the way that maybe a, a way to position the answer is to talk about like kind of how we got to where we are and you know that very much influences I think where how we're approaching the implementation of Fed now. Um you know so we joined RTP back in 2019. Um so a little while ago now. We were the 19th bank to join and the first bank on the network with less than hundred billion dollars in assets. Um, like to give a sense of that significance, as I mentioned before, there's roughly 300 participating banks now. Um, so, you know, we've established a really strong footprint in the US faster payments industry. Um, you know, and then we fast forward to where we are today we've consistently been a top five originator on the network in terms of volume. And we're actually proud to announce our first time originating over 1 million payments, uh, RTP payments in a single month. Um, it's a major, major, major accomplishment for us. Um, and it really does showcase our capabilities to support a scalable faster payments product with RTP and as FedNow prepares to go live as well. Um, our goal with building our faster payments offering, so this is kind of where FedNow especially comes into the picture, is always been, let's, we want to provide fintechs with access to cutting edge banking and technology services that they might have difficulty finding otherwise. Um, and so, you know, with the increase in use case adoption across the RTP network, which has been in existence for roughly uh, six or almost, almost six years, I think in November, um, you know, our use cases have expanded as well. Um, but the bottom line is we want to support faster payments in every use case that we can in the most responsible way. Um, and so, you know, like as, as we start thinking about Fed now coming down the pipeline, you know, Cross River, like many others, such as our awesome partner, Trustly, um, have all experienced growth in RTP from various unique use cases, such as sports betting, uh, digital wallet funds disbursements, and B2B remittances. Um, but, you know, th that's just limited to a few. Um, so I think it's, it, it, for us, it's about positioning ourselves in a way that you know, it's not really in our, our capabilities to offer faster payments. Great. And Moa, can you tell us a little more about how Trustly is is looking at Fed now at the moment and how you guys are are looking to develop products around it? Absolutely. So um, when we were having a conversation before this call, I my what I thought was that RTP had been around for five years, but Matt actually told me that it was eight. And the reason I, I want to call that out is Yes, it's 65% DDAs. I think for Trustly payouts, we cover oh, uh, we cover about 82% or 83, something like that of like 
trustly payouts that are eligible for RTP today. But it's taken eight years to get there. So adding FedNow for us in our product offering initially is not going to make that big of a difference because a lot of the banks that are connected to connecting to FedNow initially are already RTP participants. But having that growth of more and more FIs joining, of course, will add to the reachability of our instant products as well, because we can, to Matt's point, uh, a big um, use case for us today is for online sports betting. We have merchants in that space. And how can then consumers get paid out instantly? Uh, you know, I go on a website, I place a bet, hopefully I win some money, and then I want to take that money out so I can do that instantly. Um, so we are very excited to be part of the growth of FedNow, but we don't see it making that big of a difference in terms of reachability right away. Um, from, from sort of a user perspective, I think we, our intention is that it will be seamless, right? So we will do the routing. So you won't know if it's, you know, a FedNow or an RTP transaction, it will just be, you know, I want my instant payment. And so that should be the same for merchants and consumers. It will just be an instant option. So how do we build that user experience so that it's seamless for, well, everybody, including us, I guess. Um, and then I was, I was thinking, um, I mean, there are, of course, things that we have to build on our side to make sure that everything works, but the intention is that it should be uh, seamless. Um, so we're super excited to see the growth of just, you know, especially smaller FIs, because now on RTP, it's, yeah, it's 300 to Matt's point, but it's like larger ones, mostly. Yeah. So we're excited to see that um, smaller FIs joining as well. Right. So this is an interesting point, right? And this was something I wanted to get at with both you and, and Matt for, uh, talking about it, basically, as we're talking about both RTP and as we're talking about uh, FedNow, they've often often been discussed as potential competitors. And we have seen that to an extent within Europe and as we've had uh, both a, a government system develop and a private system develop. And so you mentioned earlier, Moa, that you think that uh, obviously some of the, what really stood out to me earlier was something that you said that, that the uh, smaller businesses, smaller merchants potentially might not be able to do RTP or do both, I should say, at the same time because of the cost prohibitiveness. So as we're seeing both these systems come out, what makes more, more sense for RTP? What potentially makes more sense? What use cases make more sense for uh, for FedNow? Um, yeah, I, that's, a, that's a very good question. I, I, think, I think it's important. It depends on who you are, if I can start there. So are, if, you're, if you're looking, if you're an FI, um, I mean, there are all these ways that you can look at where are my payments actually going and like where, who do I want to reach essentially? And so that that's one piece. And then of course you have sort of the investment piece. And, and I don't know that well enough to, to answer exactly what that looks like, but for me, from a cost perspective, what makes sense to connect to, but mainly, you know, who do I want to reach? Uh, are there functionalities of differences from a product perspective? What are the differences in terms of functionalities that I would like to access? Um, Today, we, we haven't really touched on that yet, but it's the benefits of instant payments is mainly on the disbursement side. So you have the credit transfer, like from, from our perspective, it's a payout, so merchant to consumer, but the um, incoming side, so the deposit side, consumer to merchant for our use case is still missing because we have, we do have requests for payment available, but it's not really established because the a lot of banks have built a functionality to send the request for payment, but not actually responding to it. Uh, and those who have the user experience isn't, there's a lot of friction in there still. And I know uh, because uh, we're part of the um, like RTP, uh, RFP work group for FedNow and working really closely with them, I know that that is something that is actively being worked on. So maybe the request for payment functionality will be better, if you may, for FedNow sooner, I don't know, than RTP or the other way around. So what are the products that I want to access? And that should be able to answer what makes the most sense. But I'll defer to Matt on like the technical pieces. Yeah, Matt, I thought you yeah, were um, along. Yeah, the, the, R, the request for payment story is, is interesting because um, it's very much dependent on adoption. And I think that's if we look at the macro level, the only way that you can send requests for payments is to is if the bank that's receiving it can actually take it and, can, and present it to its customer, and that you know it has a a safe and um, you know well established 
uh, product or process built around that. Um, so that's really where that that's a story for at least on the RTP side, given it's you know that that's it's been live. Um, a lot of the work has been you know what can what can we do to make um, more banks comfortable with using it. And so you know as that happens, you know we we are we are waiting. Uh, other banks are waiting to to have that you know to see to see that start to scale so that we can go to our customers and say you know, this is something you should consider. It opens up a lot of different opportunities. Great. I should also, I forgot to add earlier uh, for folks who are just joining us, please do put the Q&A questions that you may have into the Q&A box. We'll be asking them later. Um, so let's take a step back for a second and, and also look at just basically the state of incident payments right now within the US. What industries do you think are going to be the first, right? What industry are you seeing as the first to to really jump on this beyond beyond the gaming and gambling side of things. Uh, well, I'll I'll certainly speak from the bank side. Um, what I can say is, you know, we we don't I don't think we want to discriminate use cases across you know either network. You know, we like to think about is it's it's almost use case agnostic. Um, the networks are are available to use to get your money from point A to point B faster how that you know for for who that's that money's facilitated as well as you know when the who what when where why you know we as the bank aspire to you know as i mentioned before we we just, we aspire to process payments for you know virtually any use case just as long as it's in a, a responsible way um and so you know obviously as the bank you know ha having to adhere to regulations and you know other um other rules that govern how we facilitate payments um and you know anything else that's more just so for every bank to follow across the fdic the cfpb um just to name a few we just need to make sure that we follow the rules there and then everything else is just a matter of um you know can we start to get scale in certain use cases um and so, yeah, I mean, I would definitely say that the the most common use case, um, the most common use case, which again is is shared by RTP and soon to come Fed now, is disbursements from digital wallets. Um, you know, we think about simple use cases such as in the sports betting um, use case. You know, you win, mm -hmm. you win big on on a you win big on on a, a big game over the weekend, and you want to cash that money out, and you want to get it right away. So you, you, you know, that's, that's obviously one use case, or then if we all just think about doing a bank transfer from Venmo, that's another digital wallet use case that, you know, we have the option to send a, a standard transfer, which is one to three business days, or we can do an instant transfer. Uh, I'll let, I'll let Mo elaborate a little further on, on the sports betting side. Sure. I mean, I don't know how much there is to say, especially about that. I think it's it's exactly what you said. You know, you place a you place a bet and you want to get your money out. And before it's, I mean, to your point, most of that is happening over the weekend. So why shouldn't I be able to get paid out over the weekend too? Um, but I think that to your point as well, there's so many other use cases that, that you know we we look at insurance payouts. I think is a, is another uh, good example. You know, maybe something happens. And I need to be able to get that money out quickly uh, or quicker at least. So that's, I think it's a really great use case. Um, another one that's not really possible today because of rules of the rails, but that I think could be, at least from, from my personal experience, a really good one is money remittance. Um, as I mentioned, I moved here about a year ago now and uh, I have a bank account in Sweden. I have a bank account in the US. Transferring money even between my own bank account today takes a couple of days. And I, for me, it's, it's one of those things where everything else is moving fast. So why should it take three days to move money even between my own accounts? Um, so I think that's a really great use case once the rules of the rails allow for that. Um, payroll, I think, is, is an, another great example, especially for, you know, maybe more like the gig economy. Maybe I'm, a, you know, I drive a an Uber or I, you know, do something and I, I, I work today, Tuesday, and I can get paid Tuesday, you know, theoretically. And then I think lastly, something that I, I mean, we're talking mostly about online use cases, right? But there are so many 
offline use cases too, or like, you know, not online payments. So uh, paying instantly in a store instead of having that money, you know, move out one or two days later. Um, or, you know, maybe I go to a food truck and I'm able to pay instantly. There's to Matt's point, they're like the use cases are the same as everywhere else where you can pay. So I, I think it's just a matter of um, implementing it. And again, getting people to use it. I think that's key really, because it's, people need to understand how how is this different than what I'm used to and why is it better for me or is it better for me because there might be situations where it's not but um, I think education is going to be key to uh, the continued success of, of instant payments right and when we're talking education and people are we talking about consumers are we talking about FIs are we talking about merchants um, I think everyone, uh, again, like I, I, I've sort of watched it when I was, I used to live in the Netherlands for a couple of years and in Europe overall, I should say, we also don't really have the credit card culture that's here. So moving, I think from a, a debit card to, you know, an account to account payment or, you know, an instant payment or even moving from, again, I take that example, like from SEPA credit transfer to SEPA instant credit transfer, that that transition has not been as big, but understanding what the difference is, especially if you compare ACH uh, here to uh, RTP, like they're pretty big differences. Maybe I'm used to being able to go and say, well, you know, I didn't make this payment or like quite easily make a, a return. Of course, there are ways, like if, if I get... You know, if somebody, uh, if I come across a fraudster, uh, of course there are ways for me to address those types of issues, but it's not the same way that I'm used to. Um, so educating people, why, how does that work? And that is at the consumer level, at the merchant level, at the FI level, but also at the rate level. Because I mean, again, if I take the European example, I think that, I don't know exactly when, but the European regulation is even changing now to put a requirement on FIs that you need to make the instant payment option available. It needs to be very easy to find. It needs to be the same price as a non-instant payment or even lower. So it's like really supported even from like a regulatory perspective. And I mean, if we look at the growth of open banking in Europe and the introduction of PSD2, especially with the requirement on FIs to have payment initiation service or PIS APIs, so it's very easy for consumers to initiate payments from, from their accounts. And uh, those are of course, instant and non-instant options, but there are all these supportive things that can come from you know, a regulatory perspective, from the rail perspective, and then again, educate. So there are all these, thi all these things that need to come together so that it's attractive to use, that it's easy to use and, and all these things. And then again, <clears throat> understanding what does that mean for me? wherever in that, you know, ecosystem you are, um, I think is important. So this brings up some really fabulous points uh, that goes in, in several different directions. So I'll start with this. Um, I think I was I was speaking with the folks over at Stripe not too long ago, and I asked them about FedNow. I asked, are you implementing a service related to FedNow? Are you doing anything around FedNow? And the answer was no, we are, we're waiting and watching. One of the reasons is there is no regulatory mandate within the United States for FIs to implement that now. And, and that limits kind of the, the network effects. And so do you agree that that's a limiter? Can we hit a point where the US government will say, everybody needs to implement this in some way, shape or form? And I will, I'm gonna a, make you talk, Matt. <laughs> no, of course that that's a, it's, it's definitely true. Um, there is no mandate. <clears throat> um, it, I think you know if we look at how RTP became the network that it is today with 65% DDA reach. There was no mandate there either. In fact, the clearinghouse's network, um, you know, it wasn't there. There was no value proposition to present to banks to say, "Oh yeah, well, you already have a you know existing Fed line connection, use, which is what you use for ACH and wire originations with the Fed." So, you know, this will be easier. There, nothing like that existed. Um, at the end of the day, I think as the use case adoption increased and, you know, as, as I think there were more success stories that were able to back why the faster payments were great, that's kind of where, that's really where the adoption started to, to scale. Um, 
you know, as, as far as like, will the Fed do something like, you know, mandate a faster payment system adoption going forward? I definitely think that there's a chance, but not anytime soon. And, you know, at the end of the day, we don't know, we don't know what the, you know, the Fed's outlook is on that. And until we, honestly, until we see how adoption of Fed now will occur, it's, it's hard for us to make a well-educated estimate at best. Um, so, you know, all, all of that said, while there is no mandate to join Fed now, there are certainly benefits um, that Fed now has, which, you know, were such as a lot of these banks that are already working with the Fed to originate uh, legacy payments. There's some, you know, there's, there's at least a, a they've, they've at least like gotten, let's say a, a quarter of the way there. And then on top of that, um, there are other benefits that that Fed now um, can provide to to all banks that join, um, which I think are are important when it comes to thinking about how you manage your liquidity. Um, you know, how are you going to connect either by yourself as as the bank, sell, like a direct connection, or would you connect through a service provider such as Fiserv, FIS, or Jack Henry? Um, you know, I think these are all, and, and not to mention there there's correspondent banking. Um, correspondent banking basically means a bank is in the, in the context of faster payments. It means a bank is is one bank is is originating a faster payment on behalf of another bank. Um, so you know we we have also seen that the Fed's the Fed's focus among one focus among several is to uh, to target community banks and and local local community banks and credit unions, um, which otherwise may not have had the capabilities of of supporting faster payments so you know we, if we actually think about it that's could that is very well represented by that 35 percent of ddas that aren't on rtp um you know obviously we we do expect that you know the banks the, the banks of those sizes will you know adopt rtp um, at the end of the day we don't know however i think it's it's a it's a very compelling story Certainly on the Fed now side for um, you know the, the the adoption of these smaller banks, which you know at, which you know could actually result in yes, it's the the availability of the accounts are perhaps uh, segmented to either or network, um, but holistically it covers everything. So it's 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 creating slowly but surely creating that the faster payments ecosystem as opposed to it just being one specific network. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because it seems like there's going to be both um, competition, but also patchwork benefits of having kind of both Fed now and RDP working together within the US at least. And it'd be interesting at least to see on the pricing side too, if we get we see fees being pressed between those two systems as well. Um, but of course, that is something that none of us can answer. <laughs> so I'm going to move on from, from making anyone answer that. Um, I think one thing that we would one one thing that Moa brought up earlier as well that we all have on the back of our minds uh, as well is fraud, right? Like fraud is something that may come up more frequently with something like instant payouts, payments in general, where we no longer have that check and balance in the middle that that goes, wait a minute, let's hold this, let's look at this. Um, I'm gonna just ping you again, uh, Matt, can you tell us a little bit how Crossover is currently looking at dealing with that issue? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so both the RTP and FedNow operating rules state that banks are required to monitor fraud. Um, so you know, Crossover as the bank has an obligation to make our faster payments offering safe and compliant to ensure the best customer experience. Um, as faster payments around the clock, so you know, we're just talking both networks, um, and they are also immediate and revocable, the risk of the fraud is, is inherently higher. So we do spend a significant amount of time managing and improving our, our various controls that we maintain specific to fraud management. Um, the first way that we do this is through a robust customer due diligence process. Um, so you know, like this, is, this is meant for the bank to ensure the partners that we onboard are practicing the highest standards of compliance and uh, as well as fraud and risk mitigation frameworks. Um, second to that, you know, once once these customers undergo and are you know and complete the the onboarding and due diligence process, um, we maintain a strict transaction monitoring and reporting framework. 
Um, you know, that includes both proactive and reactive fraud screening. Um, and not only do we do that, we gather the data from that monitoring and all, all the reporting that we gather and we analyze it for trends that, you know, can help us improve our framework going forward. So it's really just a constant process. Um, and, you know, I would say in parallel to both of those things, it is at the end of the day important to educate. Um, you know, just being able to, to, to cite, you know, like what are the trends in fraud? Um, what are the, you know, wh whether it's, it's unique to a specific payment rail or, um, you know, if it's, if it's unique to a specific use case, all of those things are important, um, as well are, you know, what the metrics are. So, you know, this helps our partners understand what they need to be privy of in order to transact safely. For sure. And Moa, I wanted to jump throw this to you because I think a big part of fraud right now is the question of how do you have different banks communicating with each other and, and having that conversation about um, sharing data, but sharing it in a way that's safe so that you guys can catch the bad actors. So I'll let you also speak to this as well. We'd love to hear your POV. Yeah, sure. Um, I think very high level. I mean, unfortunately, I want to start. There will always be people trying to do bad things. I don't, I don't see that ever going away, even though, you know, that would be nice. I don't, I don't see that happening. So how do we solve for, I mean, this is a new product. It's a new rail. It's, there are a lot of new things. And I think it's very important to try to not get so much trying to fit, you know, a square peg into a round hole. Like we have the old rails and that's how we address the different, you know, fraud, fraudulent behaviors. And like, this is what we see and this is how it works. And then trying to plug that into new types of, of situations, but rather looking, what are we seeing now and how can we solve for that specifically? Because there's a lot of functionality. When I, when I hear like industry discussions and, and things like that, I, I kind of get the sense that it's like, oh, but this is what we see with ACH or this is what we see with wires. And then it's like, of course, some of that is applicable, but there are also a lot of things that are entirely new. So how can we solve for that specifically and not build a lot of functionality that we don't even know if it might work, but rather, because typically what we see, and this is true in, in, uh, for Trusted Europe as well, is when we launch something new, then we see a lot of activity where people are very clearly trying to, how can I stick holes in this and how can I take advantage of it? And then, okay, how is that working? How do we address it? And then very much like a learning by doing, uh, of course, with experience, but learning by doing how do we address those types of issues? So that's that's one thing that it's not trying to fit. How is our ACH fraud system going to be applied to RTP? But how do we build an RTP fraud prevention system? Of course, with the experience of ACH, but for example, I think that's that's one. Um, and then what kind of data can we add to payments so that it's more safely, if you may, flows through uh, all the layers of, of that payment. So can we uh, use the, you know, ISO 222 field, whatever, to just like add that, you know, ultimate debtor, ultimate creditor, and we have all that data available now. So how can we use that to make sure that when I get a payment presented to me that I can check, oh yeah, this is indeed who I want to pay. Um, if I take the European uh, example, again, the regulation is again changing that there needs to be a verification that it's like, okay, this is who I want to pay. And, you know, a ping back basically saying, yes, that is that person. So there, there are all these lessons. And to that point as well, there are, I don't remember, I looked it up a few months ago, but like there are a number of instant payment rails available around the world. Um, and the problems are the same. So how can we learn from uh, you know, prompt pay in Thailand? How can we learn from NPP in Australia? How can we learn from separate credit transfer? It's not new. There are a lot of issues that are going to be the same because, you know, the payment type is the same. It's instant. So, um, you know, how, and I, I think interoperability was addressed before, which I think is, is interesting because, you know, RTP and FedNow, you have to connect to both right now. Uh, would there be a possibility for them to to connect eventually, I don't know, so that we get that ubiquity in the US, but also can there be inter interoperability between uh, other rails or other currencies? And what have they learned in those situations? Again, uh, Singapore, UPI and India, they've all already done this. So what can we learn 
from their successes, but also their mistakes um, in fraud and other areas. So I'm gonna uh, ask a, a poll question for our audience and then jump back into this and then head back into Q&A a little bit too. So second question for our members of the audience, has your company already begun implementing FedNow into your payment strategy? Yes, no, we're thinking about it. Should we really? That's a spicy one. Um, let us know, we'll get back to it in a second. Uh, just let's head back for a second though into uh, as we're waiting for the, the answers to come back in, what can we learn from what's been implemented? What mistakes should we steer away from? And Fed now as we're looking at UPI, PICS, all these different systems that have been already implemented? Um, I think, I don't know PICS well enough. Uh, UPI, I, I think is a sort of a similar again, but also a sort of a different animal because a lot of uh, countries like India, you also have like M-Pesa in Kenya where it's more, this financial inclusion is was, I should say, very, very low. Um, it addressed a number of other like pain points in that country. So actually getting people connected to, to the finance system essentially. So there are a lot of things that doesn't really apply necessarily the same way everywhere. But I think um, if we look at um, separate credit transfer in Europe, I, I've mentioned a couple of like, how, what's the, how is pricing impacting the reach of, or like the success of instant payments? How is, um, how is fraud addressed? How can we make sure that we have that account verification feature maybe included? Should that be a requirement? Um, there are um, lots of lessons to be learned from open banking um, regulations and like growth of open banking in different countries. Uh, if we look at uh, API, so more like from a technical perspective, because right now it's, there's no mandate here for, for anything essentially, but if a lot of banks then start building their own APIs, what will that do again for ubiquity of, I mean, today it's only data in the US, but there are all these things that a lot of countries have already gone through. So instead of reinvent, reinventing the wheel, uh, let's learn from that when we can, uh, I would say. Great, I'd love to see what the answer was to the poll. We're still assessing. Okay, so lots of folks on that end, uh, the majority, are, I'm surprised. <laughs> I would love to know who the three percent, those two folks that said, should we really are? <laughs> uh, and then we've got mostly, it seems like most people are on the fence still. Um, we have a few yeses, but 43% uh, are on the fence and 32% are just flat out saying no. So I think that implies that they're not even thinking about it at the moment, which is interesting. Is this in line broadly with what you guys have been seeing? Yeah, I would say so. Um... Uh, it, it's, you know, I, I think as it relates to education, it, it, it's, I think it's the way that it's positioned is really important. Right. Uh, you know, if it's, if it's positioned as, Hey, uh, you know, now this is another rail that you can choose between RTP and Fed. Now that's one way to look at it. The way that we are framing it cross river is we now have the opportunity to build something that's that reaches more accounts, that leverages, optimizes the benefits of both the RTP and FedNow networks. And you as a customer don't really have to do anything different. So, you know, our, our dedication is being able to move money from point A to point B in the most efficient, effective, and safe way. Um, so, you know, we as a bank take on a lot of that responsibility to, you know, to, to really, to create that interoperability at our level knowing that you know you, you it's not as simple as you can send one of those iso payment messages a credit transfer payment message on rtp and take that and send it on the fed now network it doesn't work like that however we we can tell our customers hey you originate this payment the same way you have before and now you could have access to both um so you know we're we're really trying to 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 prove that out and, and build that flexibility um in an effort to, you know, to, to basically tell our customers that it's just going to better your chances of getting that payment to, from point A to point B. Great. Um, I'll go ahead and jump into audience Q&A because we've got quite a lot. Um, so some of these may have been covered in a bit, but uh, some of these have not been. Uh, one attendee asked, it was once stated, 
by numerous outlets that there would be close to 100% FI coverage by the end of 2021, yet we are nowhere close to that. What has slowed down the rollout? Uh, I'm not sure if he's talking about instant payments, RTP, or FedNow in particular, but I'm going to guess. So uh, I'm going to, unless you would like to answer in the webinar chat, if he's still, he or she is still around, I'm going to go ahead and guess that is uh, RTP. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, a, a common myth that I that I hear with having access to, to the RTP network and just, you know, we think about just kind of fat, faster payments called that is that in the snap of a finger, you'll have access to it. Um, the reality is it requires technology. Um, it requires you to understand the implications of supporting a network that is um, settling payments immediately uh, irrevocable, it, these payments are irrevocable as well as the fact that it's available 24 seven, you know, we look, we look at, you know, what bank standard operating hours are. It's not, it's not 24 hours, seven days a week. Of course, customer service is open, but you know, I, the operation side is, it, you know, people go home and that's right. the way that's, that's just the way that it's been. Um, those are all things that I think were a bit underestimated just by the overall market. And as a result has, a, has you know, we've seen that it, the adoption has been slower. Right, the human sleep. <laughs> yes, exactly. Unfortunately. So, right, some okay. of us. <laughs> okay, and then uh, next question that we did have is, uh, what is the, we, we did get to this a little bit, but this puts it a little bit on the nose. What is the level of interoperability between RTB and FedNow? Uh, for example, for two banks using one of these networks each. Yeah, um, this is you know th this is kind of let, let me pivot this to the the biggest question that I get is what's the difference? You know, how, and I think like that's really the 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 key in stating how truly interoperable these these networks are. Um, the truth is that FedNow was designed in a very similar manner to RTP. Um, it was done that way. Um, there are some differences, but they're very minor. Um, when there are more than one faster payment system in any market, uh, it's imperative that they have interoperability between one another. Um, and so, I mean, the, the fact that the settlement occurs immediately and that they're both available to use 24 seven is, is one way. Um, the, the addition of, um, the use in addition, the use cases are like they're pretty much the same. It's agnostic to the network. So, um, you know, that, that's another one. And, it, and I would say alongside that, the, the ISO message specifications for how you, you know, actually send the, the payment messages and all of the non-payment messages are, are also very similar. Um, and, you know, the, the payment flows themselves are nearly identical. So, you know, there's, they're both credit push only, they operate on good funds. There's no debits. In other words, no pulls. However, there's a debit equivalent where where you can request money from someone else if that person accepts their bank. Excuse me, sir. Um, the if if that person accepts the the bank does a credit push from their account to your account, and we call that the request for payment. So you know, the, as far as the differences are concerned, there there yes, there is no way to a real time payment message on FedNow, like that level of interoperability is not, you know, that's not been achieved. Um, but the, the, the differences are, are very minor. And, you know, as like I've meant, like I mentioned before, we as the bank have a, a dedication to, to make our own faster payments offering interoperable instead. Fair enough. Um, what is your view on RTP FedNow? being adopted for U.S. banks to process international transfers, C to C, B to B. Why do you believe this is such a challenge in the United States? Uh, so, you know, the, I think the, the, it's, it's kind of another one of those things where, you know, the, the level of effort required to implement something like that is underestimated. Um, not only is the, the, the FX conversion um, you know, let, let's just think about like the, the simple fundamentals of it, right? There's FX conversion involved. There's, um, there's, 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 it, there is essentially interoperability be that needs to be built between two di different payment networks. And, you know, we don't know what those payment networks 
operate on in terms of their their um, their message specifications and you know what what they require to be to for the payment to be sent and you know what 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 things do we require for a payment to be sent um you know those things are those things are not trivial and in addition to that the obviously the as as we've already seen the 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 fraud the risk of fraud and you know other bad actors that are involved becomes inherently even higher when you now have folks that are originating payments across borders. Um, so I, I think really those are the two that sum up why it's been a challenge. Uh, John Umber has two questions around request for payments. Um, one, what do you think could be the use case catalyst that will drive adoption of RFP? Uh, and how do you think FI should build rules to help combat the potential fraud of RFP? And obviously this is for either of you to answer. And I think RFP, we sort of touched on this earlier. I think um, the user experience needs to be improved. Uh, well, first of all, more and more, because like I mentioned, there are a lot of banks that can send a request for payment, but not a lot of retail banks, I should say at least, that can um, respond where you can actually respond to to that request so first of all that needs to grow and that's both rails um secondly when you have that user experience um it needs to be easier um i, I will draw a parallel with with europe again when we saw the introduction of psd2 and the banks had to build pis and ais apis so account information service and payment initiation service so how do i share my account information and how do i initiate payment or, or how do I con uh, approve, authorize is the word I'm looking for. Uh, how do I authorize uh, somebody initiating a payment from my bank account? Um, there was no uh, standardization. There was no standardization available for the European Union coming from PSD2 exactly what that should look like. The only requirement is that you had to provide an interface, but there were no instructions what that interface should look like. The UK did it sort of differently, but if we look at the European Union, which they were part of still at the time, what we saw from a trusted perspective, because this was of course great because now we could connect into all those APIs, we could initiate, we could request account information, we could initiate payments on the consumer's behalf with their authorization. authorization. Uh, but we saw a conversion drop very quickly because what happened was that the user flows were all of a sudden you had to authenticate like three times. There were a lot of steps. You had to like log into your bank app and authenticate. And it was, um, I'm trying to find a, a, it was not a good user experience. So uh, we saw a big conversion drop. And then we worked with those banks. And remember, these are all, it's not a, it's all the retail banks that we essentially had to work with. So it's, it's a lot of work. So we had to, you know, prioritize, of course, but we worked with all those banks to how can we improve the consumer experience for your customer, or our shared customer, essentially, so that they can share their information and initiate payments safely. Um, and I think there's a lot to learn from, from examples like that, because if I am used to just, you know, putting in my, um, I have my, you know, card details saved and I just put on, you know, put in the little code and then I can make the payment that's really smooth. And then I go into a different flow where it's like, I get moved from where I am to my bank app and there are all these steps. It's just friction that me as a consumer, I'm not going to like. Um, and of course, it still needs to be safe, but how do we make it safe, but also seamless, or at least like with as little friction as possible. Um, so I think that needs to, um, to change for RFP to be successful. And, and I'll, I'll also just add that, you know, there's, uh, I think the getting the commitment from the banks who hold the majority of the accounts that these RFPs are going to has been a challenge as well. Um, you know the and and the way I position it that way is, um, there are a lot of concerns about and rightfully so there are a lot of fraud concerns. Um, what the clearinghouse has been working on, particularly to request for payment to to increase adoption, is um, doing a, a bunch of things. The first one is is creating this set of permissible use cases for which request for payments can be sent. So that's a way that you know it's it's isolating just the use cases that are. Um, typically non-inclusive of fraud, not, not altogether, but, you know, certainly way less riskier than others. 
Um, another one is that, you know, the banks are looking at, um, the, the banks are, are, are now required actually to, to undergo a warranty process, which is basically, you know, it's, it's a warranty claims specifically where a customer can, you know, if they have a dispute about a payment, they, they, you know, accept it and, and paid out erroneously, um, you know, potentially if that was a fraudulent, if it was a fraudulent, um, purpose for the, for sending the payment, you know, requires the bank that sent it to, to investigate and to prove that if the payment was, um, actually for a re a, a reasonable purpose. Um, so, you know, th those are just, that's just a giving a flavor of the, the things, you know, were that, that the, the FIs are, you know, in order to participate in RFP have to abide by, um, it's not so much that the, the FIs are themselves are building the rules. It's more so being enforced at the network level. Yeah. So I think this uh, is a good way of kind of jumping into the next question. What is the state of regular regulatory scrutiny in supporting third party RTP platforms? Most banks won't touch supporting these platforms, even when like ours is a closed loop system, non exchange. How do we break through the compliance group? Yeah, um, I think the the there the regulatory scrutiny is obviously up for it's always up for interpretation um as the bank you know we part of what our our robust due diligence program is is to you know look into the platforms that that you know we would potentially want to partner with and you know just make sure that you know everything that they have in place is what we would you know, as a minimum require to, to be originating payments, just period, not, not so much specific to faster payments. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the way that we, and, and when I say we, it's just, it's really all the banks, the way that we break through that, um, you know, the, the, any, any, any challenges that we have around compliance is, is just over time, we need to continue to originate faster payments and do more. Um, you know, as, as a network is, if, if a network is scaled, that's, ind that's indicative of, you know, that, that growth is going in the right direction. And, you know, that's all, that's usually attributed to the fact that there continues to be low rates of fraud. Um, and so over time, like, that's really just the, the, that, that's kind of, that's a story that kind of writes itself, um, as a result of more adoption. So this yeah. is definitely one. Oh, sorry, go on. No, I was just, the only thing I would like to add to that is just to what we were talking about before. Like it's it's taken eight years for RTP to get to where it is today, and we don't expect FedNow to be this big explosion initially. So there's also a lot of opportunity to learn in that process as it you know uh, sequent like it gets bigger or the reach is uh, increasing. Is what I'm looking for, like over time rather than having just like big bang all of a sudden. So. I think there's a lot of opportunity to to learn during the process as well. Yeah, it does feel like we're going, we're kind of, but now at least, and uh, is currently opening up pretty cautiously. There's there's limitations currently on how it's operating. Um, so continuing on from that, let's jump on the FinTech question. So um, one of our, one of our uh, Q&A, folks are curious to see if you all had a take on the role that FinTechs could play in integrating and accessing FedNow to drive adoption into a third-party way, which has been seen in other countries. I, I think there are a lot of things that, if we take the RFP example again, um, if the RFP user experience and success of RFP, if you may, is not sort of solved from the rail or the FI perspective. Of course, there's room for, I would be surprised if nobody else steps in and say, hey, we've sold it because you guys didn't do it. So we built something <laughs> on top of what you have. Um, there's, um, as long as the rules permit, for example, for the international payments piece, there are, again, if we look at Trust of Europe, lots of currencies, many countries, many rails, but you can connect into you know, one port and you can access all of Europe. So that's the sense. There are so many things that if the FIs or the rails themselves doesn't solve for it, there are lots of smart people in the world. So somebody will step in and say, hey, we worked it out because you guys didn't do it quick enough. So um, 
I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I'm very curious to see how, you know, things will progress because that piece is missing now. It's like, yeah, we have the disbursement side, but the deposit side, at least from a consumer to merchant perspective is missing. So how, how will that be solved? Um, not only from, um, you know, but yeah, fintechs is a good, it's a good option for that, I think. I think you often see fintechs coming in and, uh, and reaching kind of the, the populations that you typically wouldn't see reached as well. So that's definitely true too. Um, how do you see, I'll give you, I'll bring up our last question. Um, how do you see this affecting, I believe this being our, uh, the development of FinNow, how do you see this affecting legacy payment rails such as ACH, Venmo, MasterCard for B2B, B2C and B2C? So that's a big question, <laughs> three big areas to go to. What future divergence do you see away from legacy payment rails? Uh, so let's just stop there. It's a great question. Um, so if you, we look out, we, if we look how long ACH has been around for, we're talking like, I, I want to say at this point, we're close to half a century. Um, if we, if we fast forward to, to present day, ACH is still such as an overwhelmingly large uh, share of, of how many of, of, of payments being originated today across the, or, or yeah, across the entire country. Um, I, th I think that the, it, it will displace legacy payments and, but it's not just fed now. It's really just the, again, faster payments. Like it could be real time payments and fed now. Um, but either way that, that, that displacement will happen. Um, there's no doubt. What I, I I would say specifically for things like Venmo, the the um, the actual way that Venmo works is it does actually um, it does actually originate an ACH payment behind the scenes. Um, so if, like when you're trying to bank transfer your Venmo balance, that that's typically done through an ACH transfer unless you use the instant option. Um, but even if you don't have the sufficient Venmo balance to pay somebody, um, it, that, that will debit the bank that you have um, listed on, on your account. And that's also through ACH, right? So, so it still is very deeply embedded in, in Venmo. And, you know, uh, until, and I think this is, this is part of the, um, the, this is part of solving for both the, the pay-ins as well as the payouts um, until you can get both sides of that flow on a faster payment rail and do it at scale, it's, it's going to be difficult. Um, with card networks, I think it really just depends on the use case. Um, you know, if you look at a lot of these larger banks, there isn't a whole lot of appetite to, to displace card pay or even just like card payment processing, but also, you know, card payments um, because of interchange. You know, I think that's sort of, you're sort of cannibalizing your own business as a result. So, um, I think that's that's just one that are I think of the larger banks, which you know do represent majority of the of the the accounts that would be originating these payments that they need to be wary of. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you know if we if we were to look thirty to forty years from now, I, I would I, I think it's it's a I, I think it's pretty safe to say that that most if not all payments will be faster. Um, you know, I think. Again, it, it really just depends on what the use cases are. Either way, the money will get from point A to point B faster than it does today. Yeah. And Moa, did you have any final closing thoughts? The only thing I'd like to add is, I mean, there are also, you know, the network limits, you know, our RTP is 1 million, uh, FedNow has 500,000. So there are use cases outside of that. So, but yeah, long-term, I, I definitely agree, but you know it's going to take some time because there are some you know hurdles to get past. Right. Well, in another eight years, we'll have another network <laughs> to be competing <laughs> with all of them. Um, anyway, thank you so much for, to all of you for joining our conversation today. Thank you to our panelists Moa and Matt. I think we've learned a lot about how interesting the space is going to be and very nuanced. We're going to be seeing. It seems like uh, the question of interoperability came up a lot, so that's going to be one thing to watch. And it also seems like it's going to have a very interesting. Uh, different use cases for each of these different networks and different impacts on different FIs as well. So thank you both.